Our panel topic today is surely one which is close to many leaders' hearts. Sustainability, competitive edge, continuous growth. These are the essential qualities that enable an organization to thrive, and they are all interconnected with organizational adaptability and transformation. Successful transformation can lead to meaningful growth opportunities. And effective leadership can actually encourage a culture of continuous improvement and continuously driving diversification through an organization can dramatically increase competitive edge. So as experts in the different aspects of the topic of transformation, um, Dragna, what key indicators would you use to define an organization's need for change? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> that's quite the question. We could probably spend another day talking about <laughs> just that question. Uh, I think that in today's day and age, especially, um, there is so much change uh, that is driven in every sphere of life from workplace to just general existence. And a lot of it is actually driven through technology. Um, so I am generally operating with technologies that touch humans. And as humans are creatures of habit, and I'm probably the worst one of them, um, the change is something that is almost experienced like five stages of grief because you're taking away people usually perceive change in a lot of ways as something being taken away um and as such it's really really important to recognize uh, especially in those situations where things are being replaced with something new and it's not a viral sensation uh that people will need some time to first of all um understand what is going on to reframe it in the context of what they need, and then uh, eventually learn more about it and accept it and um, eventually evolve it. And so, you know, we talked a little bit about the word transformation and my general dislike for word transformation because it does imply that we go from stage A to stage B. But I do think that um, just like in life, we sort of evolve, we just uh, grow and, and change. And, and so, whether we like it or not, things are going to change. So it's always good to have that growth mindset and basically anticipate what is coming and really get your, give yourself a head start to wrap your head around what's coming and, and, and really meet it versus trying to avoid it. And then you'll have more opportunity for growth just from the personal point of view. Now, from the actual technology uh, point of view, we have Google Workspace. I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with Google Workspace, but I imagine a lot of people do use Gmail. So for those of you who use Gmail, uh, Workspace is actually Google's unified communications and collaboration platform that was originally created for Google by Google to be as innovative as we are. Uh, and over time, we actually started offering it to the market. So today, a lot of companies who want to um, adopt Google's culture of innovation actually do invest in this platform because it's not just something that gives you editors and gives you email and gives you chat and so on, but it actually does give you a way to practice some of the principles of innovative culture. So, 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 so from that point of view, um, just to kind of go back to your question, depending on what the change is, depending on who needs to change and adopt the change, um, there are many, many different ways to approach it. But I think recognizing that people in general, unless it's something super viral, uh, will have that innate resistance and then account for that. Thanks for that, uh, Dragana. I really like also how you... Uh, chose such a human-centered analogy to explain it. Um, and I think it's an interesting to, to look at it as well, uh, looking at the word transformation, not as transformation, but as um, a journey of evolution, as you said. So Vivek, um, I would like to know, because of your expertise on the millennial and Gen Z HR uh, arena. Uh, so what are a few uh, key differences that you've observed in how millennials and Gen Z perceive change compared to older generations? Okay, so let me just uh, clarify for some of you who may not know who are the millennials. Am I a millennial or am I a Gen Z or is there some other letter there? So 
Uh, millennials are those who are born between 1980s to 1995. Gen Z are 1996 to about 2010, right? Um, so at least we are clear on the definitions of millennials and Gen Zs. Baby boomers are 1946 to 1964, and Gen X is 1965 to 1979, right? So this is just to help everyone else get placement into which generation they belong to and let me just uh, touch on the key differences so millennials of course you know they grew up during the rise of the internet and social media so they're actually quite adaptable to technological changes we call them tech savvy because they really are very tech savvy um, for them we are also noticing for millennials that you know they really value flexibility and work-life balance and in fact, we are after the pandemic, we are really seeking jobs that offer more remote work and flexible hours, right? Um, they have a desire for learning all the way, um, you know, ongoing learning, professional development. Or, and in fact, you know, they've been called job hoppers because they often change jobs to gain new experience and skills. Uh, you would even probably say that millennials are very purpose-driven because they want to kind of work for organizations that align with their values and have a clear mission and purpose. And it's not too different with the Gen Zs as well. The Gen Zs are what we would probably also see as very comfortable with technology. They grew up with smartphones, they are constantly connected. And so they're highly adaptable to digital uh, related change and new technologies. They are very comfortable with new technology. Um, and you know, they have an entrepreneurial spirit as well. We are seeing more and more of them coming out and wanting to be more like self-employed or becoming entrepreneurs, start starting their own side hustle on top of their business that they are running or on top of the employment that they have, right? So we do see these things. Um, and uh, they are also a big um, advocate of diversity and inclusion, which means they prioritize different people from different places all coming together together and they want to see workplaces that kind of reflect and support these values. So what we are seeing is the mindset of the millennials and Gen Zs. Now, how does it differ from the older generations? Well, older generations uh, tend to you know, value stability um, versus flexibility, right? They rather have that job that gives them that security and long-term employment over the flexibility of time, right? Flexibility on working hours, right? Um, in, even though they have adapted to technology, they are not as comfortable or as, as uh, you know, adaptable when it comes to switching to these new technologies. Um, they are always worried of what if I press the wrong button? What if I press the wrong thing, right? So they do have that concern, even though the technology is quite common today, right? Um, so we do notice uh, a little bit of hesitation in the older generations when it comes to that. Uh, when it comes to work ethics and loyalty, I guess they are, of course, the ones who kind of grew up at a time or they entered the workforce at a time where you kind of expected this job to probably last you till retirement, right? And of course, over time that has changed, uh, but we do see that strong work ethic and loyalty to the company uh, in the older generations. So um, when it comes to change, it is natural to see that, you know, the older generations may exhibit a little bit more resistance to change because they grew up in a different world and kind of the world has uh, changed quite rapidly over the years. So. Uh, that's also quite interesting. And maybe just one last point to touch on communication styles. You'll notice the younger generations would prefer you text them, whereas the older generations prefer face-to-face -face communication, right? Or over the phone communication. And we are seeing all these kind of different um, nuanced behaviors across teams, across organizations. So I do think there is uh, uh, these few differences that we have to look into. Thank you, Vivek, for the very detailed uh, insights on millennials and Gen Z. So now we sort of have a, an overview of the difference in reactions to, to change across these generational groups. Um, in my introduction earlier, actually, I mentioned uh, continuous improvement. And um, I know that Dragana and Vivek, you're both leaders in the field of of transformation and you also guide as well as work with other leaders. Um, I, I would like to hear um, your thoughts on, on how 
leaders can cultivate and nurture this culture. And uh, Vivek, you did mention, um, you know, this phrase resistance to, to change. And talking about uh, cultural resistance to, to change and transformation, or, or, or even the concept of evolution, as Drakna said, um, how would you advise dealing with the challenge um, of cultural resistance to continuous improvement or change, uh, Dragana, any thoughts on this uh, in your experience? Well, I mean, as I was listening to Vivek, um, I think one of the main challenges uh, to cultivate change in a workplace is that we don't have neatly stacked generations in a workplace. Like you don't have a company that's all Gen Z or all millennial or Gen X. Everyone's mixed up. And to Vivek's earlier point, people do have different preferences for communication styles. Now, maybe because I'm part of that older part of the generations, Vivek, I have to say that I have seen younger generations also resist change, resist the different mindset. So for example, to your point, there is a preference for a particular uh, way of being. And if they find themselves in an environment that's not aligned to that, they actually are quite resistant. So, um, so, so, so it kind of boils down to an organizational values which drive culture because and, and, I, and I've heard this from our one of our people ops leaders and I, and I really liked it because we at Google have different subsidiaries different organizations that serve different markets that are at different level in their uh, space whether they're a challenger or they're a leader and as such it's really difficult to cultivate a uh, completely uh, identical culture across all these organizations, but we all have the same values. And that is really what grounds an organization and its culture in a particular set of particular framework. So, 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 and that is generally set by leaders. So again, going back to the topic of this webinar, um, I frequently deal with organizations who decide to move to Google workspace from a more dominant provider. And um, to be able to explain, sometimes more senior leaders are a little scared and a little uh, apprehensive. Uh, sometimes it's just, you know, organizationally, people are concerned about introducing this type of change because you're really directly affecting people's ability to be productive. So what if it doesn't go well? And so we spend a lot of time talking about how do you start a change management initiative? You know, and it is the... the, the to me, there are about four key elements in there. There, and, and one of the critical ones is that senior leadership needs to be on board. Mm -hmm. In any organization, if you really want to drive the change all the way through all levels of organization, CEO, the senior leadership have to be on board and absolutely advocating for it, absolutely modeling the behavior you want to see, and then encouraging others to join and then also of course measuring the levels of adoption or whatever change you want to see um removing the old ways of doing things is also very useful because people no matter what you do will gravitate towards tried and true familiar no matter how painful it is so removing it makes it easier um obviously explaining to everyone what's in it for them specifically, not just what's in it for the organization, also what's in it for someone else, but it's really specifically even down to the individual. With, of course, it needs to be bundled with a lot of good education on, on the new policy and a new environment, a new tool, whatever you're introducing. And of course, measuring and rewarding these first 80% of adopters is also very good to accelerate and catalyze the process. And then of course, sometimes the laggards may need to um, get less positive reinforcement on, on their, you know, um, apprehension about moving forward. So, so those are sort of some of the essential, I think, steps that in any change will definitely um, drive results and give people an opportunity to get their, you know, what they want. Now, again, understanding these different generations in a workplace and you may have to actually figure out ways to motivate different people differently mm -hmm. and, and communicate things to them differently to be mixed earlier point. So, so it is not a very uh, easy topic, but it is a very rewarding um, process when you get to the desired outcome. 
totally agree as well, Dragna, about the um, piece on how alignment is just so important uh, and it starts really right from the top. Um, it's interesting when we're dealing with people um, and Vivek, actually to this point, as Dragna has mentioned, actually um, some of the younger generations like uh, in the workforce, like millennials and Gen Z do uh, have exhibited uh, resistance to change as well. And as an expert in this topic, um, uh, what, what would you say in your experience are the primary reasons for this cultural resistance that these generations might have? Well, I think when we talk about, you know, just referring back to what Dragana said, right, it's not uh, generation specific, uh, but at the same time, you know, we do see that there are certain things that matter more because their values are a little different, their preferences are a little different. Today, we are seeing a lot of the younger ones uh, being a little bit more resistant to going to back to a work from office situation. Right, uh, because they have experienced this and they kind of prefer that and not really taking into account how it then affects the business, right? So for them, uh, they are looking at a few things. So what else also kind of, um, you know, contributes to the resistance? Number one, I think um, when we don't communicate the why and the bigger vision and how it all plays out, right? If you don't paint the big picture and they don't see the big picture, and if it's not aligned with their values, then we will kind of see a little bit of resistance. Number two, lack of involvement, because when uh, millennials and Gen Zs are actually considered for the opinion, considered for what their voices, uh, you know, what are the opinions and uh, things that they want to say in the entire change process, right? Um, and they are given feedback of how their opinions have kind of, you know, uh, kind of contributed to a certain decision, they feel a lot more engaged, but when they are not involved, then there is a little bit of resistance. It could also be that, you know, sometimes previous past experiences that you've had also um, kind of make you skeptical about how this is going to go, right? Um, sometimes it is everything happening too fast at the same time, right? So the overwhelming pace of change sometimes can get to us. And it may lead to a little bit of fatigue and you don't want to, you know, go through change. So th these could be a few things. And of course, uh, sometimes we also need to cater to like their preferences. What, what are the visible benefits of this change, right? Sometimes we, we, we say what's changing, but we don't say how it, how it helps them. So it's also important to consider the radio channel everyone likes to listen to, what's in it for me, right? W-I-I-F-M. Right. So uh, if, you know, we can speak and communicate in a way that appeals to the person who's listening, I think we can have less resistance and more buy in. I'm, I'm hearing quite a few overlaps between uh, your answers, actually. Um, it's it's very clear that a vital uh, and, and clearly communicate, uh, communicates that shared vision is important important and of course we've talked about incentivization as well like what's in it for me that's a channel that everyone can get on board uh, about so um what would you say are some best practice uh ways of communicating this vision in a way that is not only just getting the message across to uh, obviously the leaders but also to all the important stakeholders um Dragna, would you have any thoughts to share on that? Um, so yes, there are many, many different ways you could do this. Uh, there are, I actually have even uh, seen a case where in one organization, the new CIO came from advertising industry. And because he came from that multimedia domain, he actually decided to first explore and investigate within that organization how people saw themselves using the new technology he was planning to introduce. And then he went out and created a video, like, like a, like a promotional, like almost like a promotional video where he had different personas, you know, illustrated having these great new experiences. And that led to um, a much faster and broader adoption. And it was almost like a marketing campaign that was ran um, which was not something that was typical for IT, but it did result in very, very fast transformation and adoption of what he wanted to do. So there's that one extreme that a lot of people potentially wouldn't have the budget for. Uh, so, so, But still, I think depending on the size of your organization, you may have to create 
also your champions of change, people that are, you know, if you have a very large organization and you really want to reach the grassroots, it's always good to also um, deploy a bit of an army of champions of change out there to just socialize the ideas and float them by people and get feedback. And so that you can actually, maybe in advance of doing anything, you can actually optimize a lot of things. You can optimize your communication, you can optimize your strategy. And by actually listening to people's input, uh, you will get uh, more acceptance upfront than if you just bring something brand new, unexpected, potentially scary to, to, to a group of people that are not aware, you know, what we've just discussed before in terms of what's in it for them, uh, what's in it for the organization, why are we doing this? So um, just to echo what Vivek said, like why is so important? Because a lot of times in very hierarchical and sort of, um, um, I guess, dominant leadership style organizations, sometimes leadership likes to tell and, and tell is more focused on what and how versus why. So, so giving people benefit of a doubt and really um, bringing them along on that journey as willing participants and someone who's going to be um, excited to go along and who's going to celebrate the success with you is always a better way to go. I really like that. Um, there's a saying, show, don't tell. So I think it's really resonating with me what you're saying right now. Um, Vivek, anything to add? Well, I think uh, yeah, Dragana actually covered most of it, um, you know, specifically when it comes to getting buy-in, having ambassadors or what we call these champions uh, okay. really help to, you know, move the needle. So yeah, totally in on that. And so actually, I would like to uh, know both your thoughts on this. Um, what leadership qualities are important, you would say, uh, when it comes to driving transformation or rather evolution um, and guiding an organization through the any change plan or, or evolutionary process? Uh, would you say that these qualities in, in a leader are innate or can they be developed? Uh, Dragana, any thoughts on that? I think, um, I mean, I, I've dealt with clients where actually the entire leadership team, there's about 35 of them who showed up in this workshop that was supposed to be a workshop. And they were all very gloomy and very closed off. You can tell the body language. And uh, even, even a person that was supposed to actually be in a function of our partner uh, from that company, because that company wanted to also be a customer and a partner. And um, even the, even the leader of that business unit was going like, oh, I don't believe in this. This is too ridiculous, too hard, da, da, da. So then I said, okay, well, I think we need to have a therapy session to start. And then we can talk about how we do this <laughs> once, once we get everybody on board. And 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 to be honest, I, I think a frank conversation with, with these leaders uh, led, it, it was really more... It didn't take more than 45 minutes of, of discussion of, of actually hearing them out, understanding what are their concerns, what are their fears, um, why they were not open to um, looking at what we're talking to them about, and then giving them some examples of how others have overcome those challenges and really stressing that they're the leaders and it's really up to them whether they want to make this a success or not. I mean, we were all there ready to help them. But again, you know, as they say, you can lead a horse to the water, but you can make it drink. So, 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 so it's, it was really um, incredible and very rewarding. After that session, I had one of the participants walk up to me and say, you know, I never really wanted to give this a shot at all, but now I'm like all, all in, in. you know, I really think that this is going to be a good thing for us. And, uh, and so I do think leaders can change. I, I think just uh, getting people out of, you know, their standard mode of operation and really having a honest conversation, you know, being very empathetic, uh, being, you know, a bit of a guide and, and reassuring them with these um, success stories and examples, I think is very helpful to get leaders over that um, you know, potentially their own resistance. 
definitely um it's it's definitely important to have dialogue and conversation about it rather than um just uh, mon monologuing and as we talked about showing rather than just telling so then it's a two way uh, conversation where people have the chance to listen and respond for sure uh, vivek i'm curious about um your thoughts on this um what are some best practices that perhaps you can share on nurturing leaders specifically among millennials and gen z yeah, so this generation is big on continuous learning and development. I think we've seen that across the board, right? So, you know, providing them with uh, leadership training programs, um, you know, because a lot of us don't even have sometimes what we call the self-awareness of who we are as an individual. So providing them with that so that they can then self-manage and self-lead themselves. And then after that, going over to the social awareness and being able to then train and manage other people as well, because... You could have been an engineer who has now been promoted to now handle a team. And, you know, suddenly when you feel like you have to manage people and they're not as simple as, uh, you know, technology, then it becomes a little bit of a whirlwind when you don't know how to then, you know, communicate. And when things go south, how do you then recover so these are key things that we have to understand, especially for the younger generation, because for them, they are so, so uh, used to, you know, dealing with things through the phone and the devices, digital devices, that they get things like blue tick anxiety, which is basically if I send you a message on WhatsApp and you've blue ticked me and you've not responded, um, and if not responded quickly enough, you know, it gives them anxiety because they think they did something wrong or they did, they could have worded what they are requested better, right? Uh, they actually think that you are not responding on purpose, which may not be the case. So then how do you then clarify this kind of ambiguous situations, right? How do you communicate? Yeah, what is your working style? I think that is something that the younger generations definitely want to see. I know, and having that, that culture of feedback and open communication is also really important because, you know, sometimes we kind of misinterpret things, right? And when we misinterpret things, it is also important to clarify, right? And that's where the regular feedback sessions really help. It, you know, having open communication channels really help them to uh, feel that psychological safety within, uh, you know, the team, right? So when you're going through something as big as change, right? Having these open communication channels definitely do help, right? So I think these are a few things that we can look into when it comes to, you know, um, nurturing leaders and getting them to then speak up and, be the champions who then also push the change forward. Yeah, for sure. Psychological safety is something that is really important in the workspace. Um, and it's important for everyone, uh, leaders as well. And actually, I want to go back to that very uh, interesting um, metaphor that you use with the blue tick um, situation, uh, which actually leads me to my, my next question. Uh, what role would you foresee technology um, uh, playing in 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 the role um, during tran transition? And because of this um, technology uh, adoption, do you see any challenges, um, Dragana? I mean, in terms of uh, how will technology potentially make change easier for people, I do see us putting a lot of AI that will make use of new technologies that are aimed at people um, to be productive, for example, um, basically anticipating the next move and kind of propelling people through. So it becomes a lot more intuitive. It becomes a lot more fun. It becomes a lot more rewarding. So, so it's almost like the way social media was designed to give people dopamine, uh, potentially having a really good platform that has a lot of AI woven into it and that works with you is definitely an incredible way to get people on site. Um, so, so, so that would be one way. There's also gonna be a lot more technologies that are going to be um, emerging to also allow you to track your success in terms of how uh, the, a particular that technology itself or some other technologies being adopted and again offer ways to improve it kind of in real time without 
actually having to run pilots and then, you know, benchmark between your start state and end state, but actually throughout the process, continually um, adapt the learning process of the user to the point where they're really getting positive experiences. And management is also getting reassurance or whoever is tracking the um, progress of the change uh, so they can actually measure it, they can go and reward those people and and in general celebrate um, the progress. So uh, I, I think that there's going to be a lot of platforms already have some of that in them. Uh, a lot of them are adding more to it. Uh, AI is an expensive technology to run, so perhaps it's not going to be as quick as we think uh, because a big re investment is required, but it is definitely um, the way to go and to really enable a more pain-free evolution, for the lack of a better word. Thanks for the insights on that. Um, Vivek, anything else to add um, on the role of trans uh, digital technology um, in, the, in the transformation journey? Yeah, I, I do think it's also important to help, um, you know, uh, anyone who isn't as comfortable with technology to get on board. Because the more we are reliant on technology, um, you know, I do notice, um, you know, when it comes to the DNI conferences, um, the question that I get asked is, how do I get my millennial leaders to work better with the baby boomers and the older uh, generation when they are not as tech savvy? as the millennials or the younger ones may be, right? And and that's where we see, again, resistance by the millennials and the Gen Zs towards working with team members who may not have the same kind of tech proficiencies. So it is important to then we also talk about the importance of how do we then, you know, uh, as a company support uh, this change when there are different skill sets at play how do we then, uh, you know, kind of elevate the different value that they can add? And at the same time, um, how do we use mentoring and build that, that connection between the team members despite the gap in terms of generation? How do we bring them closer together? Because once we as team, as people can work better together, I think um, it is easier for the younger ones to mentor and uh, to be mentored uh, by the one the senior leaders as well, right? So I think it's a two-way process. So as much as we know that technology is something that we cannot avoid, uh, we should also think about how do we make sure everyone feels included when we are embarking on new technologies to implement the change that we are looking to see. Mm, I, I really like the idea of that uh, cross mentorship and the cross uh, cultural exchange so to speak uh, um, between the generational groups so i i do want to however go back to uh, something that dragana mentioned before which is um, um measuring success so what would you say are a few metrics that are typically used uh, in in measuring uh, transformation success? Um, for instance, Dragana, just just earlier you were talking about four steps in the adoption journey. Um, maybe you could elaborate more a little bit more on that. Um, so so no from from my point of view, again, I do have a bit of a specific dimension in which I operate. It's, it's a little more uh, finite, I would have to say, and, and, and more deterministic because for us, it's basically how many users adopt different aspects of our platform and how effectively they use it. And you can always deploy your CSAT questionnaires and you can also enable real-time feedback and you can, you can do a lot of things that are going to tell you um, how the target that of, of your intended change is perceiving, experiencing, and embracing that change, right? Um, in in the world that I operate in. Now, I also try and think out into more of how do we get people on board, perhaps with more just the ideas or or, or, or moving in a new direction with, you know, introducing new work processes. Uh, you know, I, I know Vivek was mentioning hybrid work. Like that was an interesting one to me because uh, to be honest, I actually have spent, I was very fortunate as a Gen Xer to uh, spend majority of my career with a lot of freedom on where I am. 
uh, working for high tech companies like HPE, Dell, they've all pioneered these um, hybrid work policies and places and maybe having been in sales and consulting, uh, you know, they don't really want you in the office anyway. So, so, so that further facilitated, um, well, yeah, if you're a good salesperson or consultant, you're with your client, you're not in the office. So, so, so they, uh, you know, so, so that, that gave, gave me a lot of freedom. And, uh, and then when I moved to Singapore, Singapore is more of an office culture, but fortunately we didn't have a big commute. So that was fine. And then, um, and then COVID came and then, um, I was asked to join Google. And to be honest, I, I was very concerned about Google being very office-centric company because obviously we invest a lot of money in our campuses and and in, in all the facilities and luxuries that the employees get. So obviously the company wants to, you know, have people experience that and not have empty spaces. So so um it was it was very interesting to actually talk to our people leaders when I joined about these other experiences that I've had. And I was very happy to see Google put in a hybrid policy um, after COVID because it just made sense. But where actually I have to say is as time has gone on, people are becoming, you know, everybody realizes that there is a lot of that comes in play with that serendipitous encounters with your colleagues. And you can get a lot out of that besides just, you know, being visible and and, and having more career opportunities just by the sheer fact that people think you're there all the time. But at the same time, I think there's also a cultural understanding that you don't, uh, you know, the fact that you're in your office doesn't mean you're working. <laughs> means that you could be just hanging out all day long. So, so it's really important to have these, um, um, to go back to your point, how do you measure success, right? So, so what we have OKRs uh, mm -hmm. that we set for our company and every individual in terms of, that they help us determine how successful someone is, whether they're the office or not. So, so my point is uh, really understanding what you need as your desired outcome and how that affects many different areas. Uh, and then putting specific, um, I don't know, measuring tactics in place to see yeah. how that change is impacting other stuff and as long as it's not impacting and negatively, you are going to get positive signals of in, in, that you're moving in the right direction. If you, if you are getting negative signals, then there's obviously something that was missed and needs to get revisited and 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 uh, fixed. And I think one of the things that um, happens is we go through these changes and and whether they're just pure technology change or just um, and, but it's never just technology; it's always people, process, and technology. Um, you know, what, what do we learn from failures? I think it's really important to recognize that it's never smooth sailing more, you know, in most cases, there's going to be some setbacks and each setback should be viewed more as a learning opportunity and, um, people should not be disheartened. There should not be like serious penalties imposed on those people that are expected to push things through, but it really kind of just having more of the mindful approach to the um, challenges, setbacks, and, and taking what you learn from that and, and applying it so you can move forward. Those are sort of, to me, uh, some areas that need to be looked at as you start finding ways to, to, to get people through the change. Thanks for that, Dragna. Actually, I, it really resonates with me what you've just um, shared. And it it does go back to what you were saying before about making sure that you have a clear understanding of the why, why you're doing uh, what you're doing to begin with. And actually, you said uh, you mentioned it's it's not just about the technology, but the process, people, process and technology. And actually, it's very similar to um, what we say here at Change at All, which is people, process and culture. So it really, really resonates with us. Uh, Vivek, anything else to, to add uh, to this topic? Um, I I think Dragana has kind of covered it. Uh, for me, I think uh, I fully agree with all those points raised, and uh, you know, uh, also love the fact that she addressed. So, if we do uh, experience negative signals or failures, then what's the next plan of action, right? So, I think that is also important for organizations to have in mind when they are looking at 
you know, moving towards the desired goal and at the end outcome. Yeah. For sure, for sure. And now we have um, about 13 minutes left in our session. I think this is really a perfect time to open the floor for, for some questions and comments box. Actually, we have a few questions and comments right here. I will read um, from the beginning. Um, Romeo Damien, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. <laughs> On the topic of resistant, uh, resisting change, what are some effective ways to adapt traditional change management frameworks, um, for example, ATCA, Cotter, um, what are some effective ways to adapt these traditional change management frameworks to business environments which exhibit resistance to textbook approaches to change management? Yeah, I, I mean, when it comes to resisting change, I think the biggest question we should always ask is, okay, you are resisting change, so what's the alternative? Right. What's the alternative that can still get us to the desired result? So assuming the vision has been sold, assuming that, you know, the path has been laid and there is a resistance to the way that we are doing things. And then the, the, the important question that needs to be asked is what's the alternative and then get people to share and voice out their opinions. I think what really happens when it comes to resistance is when it's a one way conversation where, you know, you just say and then there's no dialogue. Uh, when we're, when there's no dialogue, you don't get the opportunity to go deeper and deeper into the real objections that people have when it comes to certain initiatives, right? The, so when you can allay the fears that people have at the end of, you know, in the bottom of their hearts, then I think all these frameworks and all that can take a back seat and as human to human, you can have a conversation on what are the issues that need to be addressed and what are the objections that need to be kind of cleared so that people feel a lot more comfortable while maintaining that psychological circle of safety at the same time. So that would be my answer to this. Thanks. Yeah, I that. think I, I, I would say it's, it's this continual iteration of trying to find what will actually resonate with the group that you have. Because again, it depends on so many different factors, what you're facing. So, so, what works for one group may not work for the other, but but really listening to the vocal ones who are uh, loudly expressing their dissatisfaction and pointing out issues may be valuable. And then, you know, basically running some checks and surveys to figure out if others potentially agree uh, so that you can really get to the core of what is the obstacle. Uh, and then doing that iterative process to see what is going to work, depending on what and who you're trying to move. Uh, and that will not be super fast potentially, but it, you know, it, it will definitely, I think, bring results in due time. Can I just share one example of um, a, an instance? So. Uh, in India, there was this company, I'm not going to mention the company, but, uh, you know, all the ladies, once they once they hit a certain age bracket, they started to leave the organization, right? And this is something that the management found out. And like, how come our women are leaving the company? And uh, after doing, you know, a lot of introspection and speaking to them, they realized that uh, these are, it's a cultural issue in the Indian culture, right? Um, the, the wife, and the lady is expected to take care of family at a certain stage. Once you have kids, once you've settled down. So uh, according to the mother-in-law, the woman of the house should be at home taking care of family matters, right? And they realize that it's not that the ladies don't want to work. It's just that they're having this issue with their in-laws. So what they did is then to invite, they created an event, they invited all the ladies with their families, especially bring your mothers, any mothers-in-laws to come to the event. And then they showcase the impact that they were making on the organization and as a result, uh, you know, to the world, right? And that kind of helped them to kind of uh, educate their mother-in-laws, uh, you know, about the value that they're adding by continuing to work. Right, so that cultural pressure to work, right, uh, especially when you are expected not to be working, right, uh, was dealt with, and that was a very inner and deeper issue. So um, it really has to, like what Dragana said, you have to have multiple iterations to 
really identify what is the key issue that's kind of contributing to the problem and then address this, the real issue. So I thought that would, that kind of fits into this question uh, when it comes to a lot of change resistance. Yeah. It's a very um, outside the box uh, solution to it. Thanks for sharing that situation example, situational example. Uh, we have some more questions in the chat box. What are your thoughts on rewards and recognition programs? And how can it help to bridge the generational gap in the workplace? I think this is a really good question. I'll take that one. Uh, okay, so, sure. so uh, could you repeat the question again? What are your thoughts on? Yes, what are your thoughts on rewards and recognition programs? So it's like what we were talking about incentivization and how that can actually help bridge the generational gap in the workplace by addressing the unique motivations across these generational groups. Yeah, so from what I know, as far as we can go back, um, all rewards have been probably set in the 1990s and there hasn't been a lot of change when it comes to rewards and pay packages because what we typically organizations tend to do is we see what our competitors are doing and then we copy it because that's the safe thing. And then how do we then innovate, right? So if you want to, uh, you know, appeal to a lot of the different generations in the workforce, it's important that we don't have a one-size-fits-all approach where everyone gets the same thing, right? Um, in fact, if we can provide options, option A, B, C, and D, because the younger ones may not be so interested in the insurance packages when they are young, right? I, I'm, I'm fit, I'm healthy, why do I need that? But they may be interested in something else, whereas as they move into different life stages, different things take priority, right? And when we have options, then it becomes a lot more appealing for them at their life stage. And you can always discuss to change plans over time. But the fact is that a lot of organizations don't have or haven't ventured into what we call the future of pay, where we have more options that are a lot more personalized and customized to people of different age groups or life stages. So I think that is one thing that we can consider, uh, you know, for you know moving forward to appeal to a, uh, you know a wider group because uh, they do have different values and different priorities at different at different life stages, right? So I I think that's one of the key things that we can look into, which is to have more options instead of a one size fits all. For all. Yes, uh, Vivek, thank you so much for that answer to a very good question uh, by Aisha. Dragna, um, anything to add on that? Uh, absolutely agree. That's all I can say. I mean, it's very well articulated. And um, again, as things change in this world of ours, uh, there's going to be probably more and more need for change and new ways and new concerns are going to be emerging. So kind of staying current is also a good thing. Definitely. On, on how to deal, you know, with the emerging challenges and emerging strategies to 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 get people over the issues of, of change management. Definitely. I uh, totally agree with both of you. Um, and actually, um, it's it's really important to remember that it's it's a it's a world of people and and human connections that we live with even with the emerging technologies uh, that come up and present changes and now um we have um Three minutes more to the time, I would like to take the chance to thank everyone for joining us. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to participate in our dialogue. Um, and also, of course, please everyone give a round of applause to our guests, um, Dragna Biara and Vivek Iyani. Thank you so much to our expert guests for taking the time to join us.